first just want to uh, express our, our condolences. We had, uh, we believe, three FBI agents that were killed while serving a warrant down in Sunrise, Florida. We're still getting more information on what happened, and we'll have more to say uh, at a later date. Uh, today, I'm here and, and pleased to be joined by a number of our great legislative leaders, as well as Lieutenant Governor. I want to thank Speaker Chris Sprouls and President Wilton Simpson uh, for all that they're doing, as well as Representative Blaze Angolia and Senator Danny Burgess. So thank you all for being here. Floridians should have the privacy of their data and personal information protected. Their ability to access and participate in online platforms protected and their ability to participate in elections free from interference from big tech protected. What began as a group of upstart technology companies from the West Coast has since transformed into an industry of monopoly communications platforms that monitor, influence, and control the flow of information in our country and among our citizens, and they do that to an extent hitherto unimaginable. At the turn of the 21st century, online technology represented tools to liberate Americans from reliance on distrusted legacy media outlets. As social media proliferated over the past decade, citizens could directly connect with large numbers of people and could cut out corporate media outlets entirely. Over the years, however, these platforms have changed from neutral platforms that provided Americans with the freedom to speak to enforcers of preferred narratives. Consequently, these platforms have played an increasingly decisive role in elections and have negatively impacted Americans who dissent from orthodoxies favored by the big tech cartel. Now, we have seen the power of their censorship over individuals and organizations, uh, including what I believe is clear viewpoint discrimination. And as these companies have grown and their influence expanded, big tech has come to look more like big brother with each passing day. But this is 2021, not, not 1984, and this is real life, not George Orwell's fiction. These companies exert monopoly power over a centrally important forum of public discourse and the access of information that Floridians rely on. It used to be that consumers were trusted to make their own decisions about what information to consume, about which leaders to quote follow, about what news to watch. Now those decisions are increasingly made by nameless, faceless, Boards of censors, they even have a name euphemistically called content moderators. And we're told that these are private companies and that those who disagree with their decisions to regulate content and even suppress content can simply choose other services. Well, when 2.8 million Americans chose to download the application Parler and share information with friends, family, and colleagues, what was the result of that? Canceled by Amazon, Google, and Apple? What about the 88 million Americans who chose to, quote, follow President Donald Trump? Sorry, content moderators on Twitter pulled the plug, as did a different set of, quote, moderators at Facebook. This is the case even though leaders like Ayatollah Khamenei have been permitted to use these platforms to do things like call for the destruction of Israel and the elimination of Jews. Core issue here is this, are consumers going to have the choice to consume the information they choose or are oligarchs in Silicon Valley going to make those choices for us? No group of people should exercise such power, especially not tech billionaires in Northern California. Now, if I had to choose, I'd rather be governed by the first 50 names in the Tallahassee phone book than the CEOs of big tech companies. If you don't like Parler, then don't read it. Let's not have those choices made for us or before long, we will have nothing more than someone else's choices imposed upon us by a bunch of monopolies whose core business is to sell advertising. These behaviors are concerning to me, as I know they are concerning to many Floridians. It's high time that we step up to the plate to ensure the protection of the people and their rights. And I'm committed to addressing what may be one of the most pervasive threats to American self-government in the 21st century, because I believe in individual rights, privacy rights, and property rights, because I trust Floridians to choose which content to consume and which to ignore, and because I want to preserve Florida's rich, diverse public discourse and not allow corporate-owned, narrative-approved outlets to dominate our voices. Now, fortunately, I'm not alone in this fight, and I'm glad to work with the Speaker of the House and other legislative leaders as we take on these issues on behalf of the people of Florida. 
As we work together, we're united under core beliefs in the sacredness of one's voice, one's privacy, and the protection they deserve in our system of government. Privacy rights are really property rights, and just like big tech can't rummage through your dresser drawers, they also aren't entitled to track your every move. You know, someone once summed it up to me this way, when I invite you into my house and say, have a seat, I don't mean you can leave with my couch. Our founding fathers were deliberate in the enshrinement of our rights in the Constitution to ensure that we, the people, were guaranteed protection against those wishing to violate our rights. Ironically, our early founders were most concerned with the tyranny of government in deciding these rights, but today, the big tech oligarchy has in many ways become a clearer and more present danger to the restriction of the right to free speech than the government itself. And certainly, if you go back and look at the monopolies at the turn of the 20th century, uh, these current big tech monopolies are exerting power far, far more per uh, pervasive than Standard Oil ever did. Now, these issues are so important because of big tech's pervasiveness and near limitless influence in our society. With billions of monthly users and the vastness of information exchange, not only do these companies control the flow of information, they are selling it as well. This is how the, you think the business works. They take consumer data, sell it for advertising, specifically more than $200 billion worth of advertising in a given year. Um, and that's not really innovation, that's just a different form of Madison Avenue. Now, since its inception, big tech has experienced rapid and extraordinary growth. Its path, to, its path to expansion bore a willingness to engage in a host of savvy practices to advance profit while compromising the protection of consumers. Not only do Floridians share with these platforms their lives, thoughts, hopes, and stories, but also some of their most intimate personal information. But what most folks don't realize is that all these companies are taking that information, regardless of its sensitivity, and selling it to whoever is willing to pay the highest price. They've even created complex markets and exchanges for the sale of Floridians' information, all the while claiming to never sell user information. Florida's not going to be tolerating that. Florida consumers deserve protection for their privacy. And with the help of our legislative partners, we're going to stand together in support of Floridians and put a stop to big tech's practice of preying on consumers. Your privacy is important. We also are going to address censorship and deplatforming. Now, these network of Silicon Valley CEOs wield extraordinary power to the point of holistically controlling the flow of vast swaths of information in our country. In a matter of hours, a business can be dismantled, a community of friends and colleagues canceled, and even a sitting president of the United States silenced. By their own admission, social media companies view themselves as a new public square and are happy to market themselves as platforms of global, regional, and local connectivity. Make no mistake, they are nothing more than advertising conglomerates, and I'm not interested in handing over the keys to the public square to a bunch of companies whose economic interests are not aligned with the public interest. When it comes to the rightful criticism for their editing and manipulation of the public square, Big tech executives flee to shelter themselves from accountability as anything but a public forum, and that they have the chutzpah, the nerve, to insist on broad liability protection. Heads they win, tails we lose. And worse yet, a faceless and nameless group of tech employees at these companies now wield tremendous power to censor speech and enforce their viewpoint on political discourse upon the general public. If George Orwell had thought of it, he would have loved the term content moderation. Consequences of big tech censorship are felt far and wide. Take, for example, big tech's approach to censoring criticism of pseudoscientific lockdowns during the coronavirus pandemic. Well, these lockdowns were almost universally rejected in pre-COVID pandemic preparedness plans. Lockdowns at the time of the pandemic were favored by the quote narrative. And so in the name of quote science, Articles and posts warning against lockdowns were taken down and censored. The result has been the destruction of millions of lives across America, as well as increased deaths from suicide, substance abuse, and despair without any corresponding benefit in COVID mortality. Shouldn't such monumental policy questions have received a full, open, and robust debate? 
Social media platforms have become among the most powerful mechanism for a private citizen to make his or her voice heard. It is incumbent upon us to ensure those voices are not capriciously and vindictively targeted. And the worst part, they change the rules constantly based on whichever they, whatever they deem to be politically correct at any given point in time. These rules and standards are often changed without the knowledge of their users, uh, moving the goalposts on Floridians and others who use these open forums for discourse and as a source for information. When a social media company applies these standards unequally on users, this is discrimination, pure and simple. Can you imagine tolerating this kind of behavior in banking or in healthcare or in other industries? So today we announced during this legislative session uh, that we will seek to do the following. Ensure that Floridians are safeguarded against these practices from technology companies by requiring proper notice and disclosure of these changes to the standards and full disclosure of any actions taken against a user for violating the standards. We'll also seek to prevent these platforms from rapidly changing these standards and applying them unequally against users. We'll also require that users be provided the option to opt out of the various algorithms these platforms use to steer content or in many cases suppress content from the view of other users. But these provisions are of no use without enforcement and we will provide recourse for Floridians both by enabling a user to bring a cause of action against a technology company for violating these requirements of Florida law and empowering the Attorney General to bring action against the technology company for violations of these requirements under Florida's Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act. We've also seen the breadth of big tech's influence on campaigns and elections. While there wasn't a state in the union that ran a better election than Florida last year, we still saw on a national scale how articles, candidates, and content had the thumbprints of big, big tech executives all over them. You can look no further than the last several months of the election as coordinated, calculated efforts were undertaken to advance an increasingly evident political agenda of the big tech companies. The problem is, these companies are playing a significant role in the advancement of issues and candidates, but do so without recording many of their efforts for what they are, political contributions. If I were to give something of value to a candidate or political committee, it would be a contribution. But big tech has been manipulating news content and designing algorithms to give the upper hand to their candidates of choice, and they do so scot-free. Again, euphemistically called content moderation, I think it's more political manipulation. That's why in Florida we're going to take action, we're going to take aim at those companies and pull back the veil and make sure these guys don't continue to find loopholes and gray areas to live above the law. Uh, under our proposal, if a technology company deplatforms a candidate for elected office in Florida during an election, a company will face a daily fine of $100,000 until the candidate's access to the platform is restored. Again, any Floridian can deplatform any candidate they choose. You simply unsubscribe, and it's a right that I believe belongs with the citizen. Further, if a technology company promotes a candidate for office against another, the value of that free promotion must be recorded as a political campaign contribution enforced by the Florida Elections Commission. And lastly, if a technology company uses their content and user-related algorithms to suppress or prioritize the access of any content related to a political candidate or cause on the ballot, that company will also face daily fines. The message is loud and clear. When it comes to elections in Florida, big tech should stay out of it. Now, big tech has long since abdicated the protection of consumers for the pursuit of profit. Uh, we can't allow Floridians' privacy to be violated, their voices, and even their livelihoods diminished, and their elections interfered with. And with that, I'd like to invite Speaker Sprouls up to make his comments. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. Uh, not just for being a leader here today with legislative leaders on the issue of censorship and big tech, but really being the national leader, um, being outspoken on that. I'd also like to thank my friend, uh, Senate President Simpson, uh, for your work and, and the work of the, the Senate chamber on this important topic, uh, notably uh, Senator Danny Burgess, formerly Representative Burgess, uh, who's done a great deal of work on this. In the Florida House, as we, uh, as we roll out this initiative, the point person will be our Commerce Chair, Representative Angolia, who has worked uh, long and hard on this topic and knows a great deal about it, will be taking the point for us in the House. You know, a fundamental understanding of what it means to be an American is that we have equal access to the town square. 
a place that we can share our thoughts, our ideas, our beliefs with our fellow citizens. For years, I've talked about the corrosive effects of social media on the fabric of American life. The town square has largely morphed into social media platforms, and those platforms are evaporating our public square. The use of mystery algorithms, shadow banning, and other deceptive techniques distort the public square like a funhouse mirror, exaggerating our fears and feeding our rage. No one elected these companies to pull the strings of American life. They act like the five wizards of Oz. Today, we begin to pull back the curtain. If our democracy is going to survive, we must stand up to these technological oligarchs. We must keep Facebook, Twitter, and other unaccountable big tech companies accountable here in the state of Florida. They control our personal information, our photographs, videos, online relationships with our friends. Today, we're announcing a proposal to make sure that these actors won't go unchecked here in Florida anymore. Social media companies want you to believe that they have your best interests at heart, but they're out for their bottom lines, their best interests, and their ideas. Big tech firms have evolved into a kind of modern day public square. And in doing so, they have access to private information and the ability to exercise control over individuals' free speech. Their elusive standards, secret protocols, and mysterious algorithms are being used to manipulate discussions in that public square among our people, our citizens. And during the pandemic, as people have moved their discourse and interactions more and more online, Big tech giants remain unaccountable for their actions, accountable to no one. And they don't follow any rules or standards. And if they do, they surely don't share them with you or with I. With our proposal, we're going to bring into the sunshine what I call the five families of darkness. Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, and Apple. They are the big tech giants that are leaving users in the dark. With our proposal, we are pushing the barriers to finally call out their convoluted and inconsistent standards for censoring, banning, and deplatforming. We're saying no more to secret algorithms that provide no way for consumers to opt out. We won't let them continue to pick winners and lo losers among established news outlets and qualified political candidates. They can't keep frequently changing their terms of use without the consent of the user. And their antitrust ways of controlling the price in the marketplace for advertising on their platforms are coming to an end. The governor mentioned at the turn of the 20th century that it took a Republican president to push back on monopolies in order to break them down. Now it will take a Republican governor and a Republican-led legislature to do the same. Florida is taking back the virtual public square as a place where information and ideas can, free flow, can, can flow freely. We are demanding transparency from the big tech giants. Under our proposal, users will have the rights to their personal opinions and how their discussions will be handled. They will receive a detailed explanation and written notice after being deplatformed or shadow banned. And they will be aware of the algorithms used and how their posts and other users will appear in their news feeds. We will no longer allow those content moderators to, to stay in the darkness. They, these are basic transparency measures that should have been provided on day one by the big tech platforms. Today, we join as we declare that Floridians take back control of their big tech and social media giants and hold them accountable. Today, we stop the insanity of censorship and secret algorithms. I'm proud of the leadership of the Florida House and our friends in the Senate and the governor on this topic. As we begin to tackle this issue every day, the message to Floridians should be very clear. We will no longer allow this to happen. We are now here for you to push back to bring these secret algorithms, secret shadow banning policies into the sunshine. Yes, and um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to say that, you know, the big tech companies has a duty to allow differing views on their public platforms. No one should be excluded, but let's be clear, they are targeting conservatives because they are engaging in political censorship. Congress has the true power to make changes to this terrible policy that big tech has to discriminate, and it's wrong. There are, there's not much we can do as a state. Obviously, the governor and the speaker, um, and along working with the Senate, has outlined some very good plans to work on these things. But we need Congress to act on a nationwide basis to put this into um, place for our entire country. I really want to thank Governor DeSantis for his leadership role in this area, the Speaker of the House. And we have two very fine representatives and senators here to, um, to speak to this issue more. And we're looking forward to working with the governor's team to um, get this finished. Thank you. 
Thank you, Governor. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I, first, I would just want to thank the governor for his leadership on the issue. I thank you for everything that you're doing in this space. I want to thank uh, the speaker for allowing me to usher in this piece of legislation, which I think is, is very important. Uh, I look forward to working with uh, President Simpson, um, his, his leadership, and with Senator Burgess on getting this done. I believe that this is an important piece of legislation for uh, numerous reasons. Um, this issue, I've been talking with the speaker well, well before the last election, and you know, um, he expressed an interest on putting a clamp down on these monopolistic behaviors of these big tech companies. And I think it's at the point now where Floridians are getting hurt. They're being put at a disadvantage. And I think we as a state need to step in and do something. So to give you some anecdotal evidence, um, for those of you who follow me on Facebook, not necessarily Twitter, my constituents are on Facebook and I communicate with them via Facebook. I posted the other day, I made a graphic when Hernando County was getting ready to allot 1,500 vaccines um, and people had to call and make the reservation. So we made a nice little graphic, we posted it, and we were expecting the post to just blow up. A lot of shares, a lot of comments, because we know of the, uh, the demand for the vaccine. And most of the time when I post on Facebook, there will be hundreds and hundreds of likes, hundreds and hundreds of interactions, comments. But when I posted this, there was, I think, two interactions, and one of them was a share. So the information was not getting out. So this is a situation where my constituents, and I'm sure it's not just me, are being put at a disadvantage with something um, as important as COVID-19 vaccinations. So why does this matter? There was a county commissioner, brand new, she just got elected, and she doesn't have a large social media gathering. She posted it, and it was shared like 40 times, a bunch of comments. And I started thinking to myself, and I alerted the speaker, I said, this is what we're talking about here. This is the stuff that actually needs to change. And it just confirmed basically what I already knew, is that public discourse is actually being manipulated by these big tech monopolies. What we see and engage in simply is whatever big tech wants us to see at any given time. And that is a dangerous, dangerous position to be in. We need transparency. We need accountability. So while lawmakers in Washington can sit there and have hearing after hearing after hearing and do nothing, we in the state of Florida, under the leadership of Governor DeSantis, President Simpson, and Speaker Sprouls, are actually going to do something about it. We are going to step up and take action. Um, the one thing that got me really fired up is when Twitter took down the article for the Post, um, for the New York Post, regarding the Hunter Biden story. And we started saying to, my, saying to ourselves, if they can do this to a reputable news source, such as the New York Post, they can do it to everyone. And that should be scary. It should be scary for legislators. It should be scary for constituents. It should be scary for the press. That you have one set of people controlling what we see, what we hear, and eventually, if we only see and hear what they want, they eventually control the way we think. But the thing is, we don't understand how or why. What's the reasoning behind it? We don't understand their algorithms on how they're making the decisions and if it's an algorithm in itself. It may be a person behind the desk making these decisions. So today's press conference and our actions in Florida is not about regulating businesses. It's about protecting Floridians from monopolistic big tech behavior. It's about demanding transparency. It's about demanding consistency. So regardless of ideology, um, we should not live in fear that we may lose our voice just because someone in Silicon Valley doesn't like what we have to say. Nobody should have the content, the information, and the ideas they post in the public sphere to be secretly controlled and manipulated. So in short, I guess the best way to sum it up is this. You cannot win on the battlefield of ideas if big tech takes away the battlefield. All right. Any? Good morning, everybody. It's, a, it's an honor to be able to stand here with the governor, the lieutenant governor, speaker of the house, the Senate president, and uh, my colleague and, and friend in, in the house uh, who we'll be working with uh, on this important issue, Blaise Angolia. Um, this, this is not a new problem, but this is an issue uh, that I, I kind of view as an issue of first impression. Uh, and it's really uh, something that the state of Florida is leaning forward on something as critical as this when it comes to our rights uh, as, as Floridians, but more fundamentally, 
as Americans. The First Amendment states that Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free speech exercise thereof or abridging that freedom of speech. And it seems to me that the government has explicitly granted immunities to Facebook and Twitter and others under the federal law in Section 230. And as publishers of third-party content, they should not be allowed to discriminate based on content and ban individuals just because they don't agree with your viewpoint. At the end of the day, this is about selective censorship. And to me, it's really about a double standard. Regardless of a person's background, political history, religion, race, gender, or any other identifying measure, these big tech platforms cannot and should not be the sole judge, jury, and executioner of Floridians and Americans' rights. For better or for worse, social media has become a major part of our everyday life and society. And as a father with three little kids, and I know that we've also got some young dads here too, uh, standing behind me, I'm very concerned about that for a lot of reasons. So these unilateral actions just compound the problem. And the, the, the actions that we've seen in recent weeks, it sets a terrifying precedent that I believe must be addressed appropriately. We hear from constituents every day about this issue. In fact, for me, my passion on this really stemmed from a, a local constituent who I've known for a very long time, a local professional, very involved in the community. He came to our office shortly after we were elected and said, hey, I was banned by Facebook. Uh, I can't get an answer, I've tried. I was wondering if your office might be able to help us. So we did, we tried. And eventually we were able to get a response from Facebook and, and to our constituents' dismay, he was labeled and classified as a dangerous person and, danger, uh, and a part of a dangerous organization. This is, I mean, imagine being labeled that and not knowing why, not having a reason, and, and not necessarily doing anything that would ever rise to the level of something so, such, such a horrible label. So this person, because we were able to finally extract the answer, Unfortunately, the, the, the window of time to where they could reenact their account based on, on his rebuttal to their, their uh, determination had run. And so all his intellectual property is gone forever. And this is the problem we're trying to address. And it's an honor uh, and a privilege to be able to stand before these leaders and hopefully help get to the heart of this issue and do what Florida can do to protect our rights. Thank you. I want to I thank the legislators. And, you know, it... Some of this technology, I know we've obviously raised a lot of concerns about, but it should be said, some of this stuff has really been, been great for a lot of people. I think back when I was deployed in Iraq in 2007, that wasn't exactly the technological stone age, but if I wanted to communicate with someone back home, I could send an unclassified email, I could take a satellite phone, go in the middle of the desert, get a good signal, and maybe make a call, uh, and there were some other ways, but now you think about it, you could be halfway around the world or on the other side of the country. You can call your family. I could see my kids if I'm in Miami and Mamie's going to go to bed. I can say goodnight to her on FaceTime. And there's ways you can share things with people that if you're doing something special, you, you post the photos, whereas before you'd have to mail photos out to be. So there's a lot of really, really good things. People are able to connect in ways that they haven't uh, before. Uh, but we also have to just recognize uh, you know, has these, have these platforms contributed to more maladies in society, like human trafficking, child pornography? Absolutely. Have they contributed to things in school with kids like bullying? Absolutely. Have they contributed to the coarsening of American discourse and culture? Without question. So these are really significant issues that society has to grapple with. We're looking at protecting privacy, we're looking at protecting people from being censored and deplatformed, and we're looking at prevent, uh, protecting people from big tech election interference. Those are really the three overriding issues. And I would say there's been a lot of talk about censorship uh, today. Uh, they, may after, they may come after someone that thinks like me. Uh, tomorrow, they may come after someone that thinks like you.